You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Forgive me if you've heard a story like this before. But for years now, scientists have been sounding an alarm about a global crisis that threatens humanity. Only humanity hasn't done much about it because there's not much money in fixing it. No, not climate change, the other one. The World Health Organization is sounding the alarm. Its latest report says some of the most powerful weapons we have in the fight against infectious disease are useless because of a growing global resistance to antibiotics. And if we don't act now, it means even minor infections could become major problems. That clip you just heard is from almost a decade ago. So-called superbugs have only become more resistant to antibiotics since then. If that continues, which everyone expects it to, our best weapons against disease will be rendered useless and a lot of people will die. If only, despite the fact that there is much better money to be made in producing many other forms of medication, someone, somewhere, could figure out how to make some new antibiotics, some antibiotics these superbugs haven't seen before and are powerless against. If only someone could do that, well then, we'd have a real shot at a victory against the future of disease. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is Good News Week on the Big Story Podcast, where we leave you with a little bit of light and hope as we head towards the new year. Dr. Jerry Wright is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences at McMaster University. He is also a member of the Michael G. DeGroote Institute for Infectious Disease Research. Hello, Jerry. Hi, Jordan. Nice to hear you. It's nice to talk to you as well, and I realize I'm asking you to sum up a rather gigantic thing to start, but just so we have a baseline here, can you can you walk us through a little bit uh, how some diseases today have become, are becoming antibiotic resistant? Like, how has that happened and why? So we use antibiotics to treat diseases caused by bacteria, and bacteria as we all know, are very small. We can't, we can't usually see them without a microscope. And they divide very, very rapidly. So their life cycle is measured on the scale of, you know, minutes to hours, where ours, you know, for us to reproduce, it takes uh, decades. And so they can go through many generations very, very quickly. And every time they go through a generation, they can gather mutations. And the other thing that they do is they actually swap genetic information with their peers quite a bit. So there's a lot of movement of genes in bacterial populations. And when some of those genes confer resistance to the drugs that we use, we start to have the problem of drug resistance or antibiotic resistance. So antibiotics are very different than other drugs. The cholesterol-lowering medication that I take every day, I will never become resistant to it because I simply can't mutate fast enough. Mm -hmm. Whereas bacteria can mutate so incredibly fast. And so as a result, you have this constant battle with evolution. And that's at the crux of the antibiotic resistance crisis. To put it in a way that uh, maybe people would be familiar with, and maybe this is too simple, so please tell me, is this the same way that we are now used to getting updated COVID-19 vaccines because there are new variants of the virus uh, as it adapts in the wild? I know it's not quite the same thing. Antibiotics are not vaccines, but is it fair to say that, you know, that's a basis that people can compare it to? Yeah, it's absolutely the same underlying principle, which is you know, uh, that Darwin taught us in its natural selection, genes mutate and successful genes are stabilized in populations. And that's how you end up with these situations. How concerned should we be uh, right now about certain bacteria becoming resistant to antibiotics and how quickly uh, they are doing it? Yeah. So the answer to the first part of your question is that, is that I'm very concerned. And so I think others should be very concerned as well. And I've been working in this field for about 40 years. It's nice to remember that antibiotics have completely changed the way that we die, huh. right? So before the antibiotics 
were part of what we used uh, to treat disease. Most of the diseases that we died from were infections. And we're not used to this in our current modern times, uh, other than the sort of big surprise of COVID, where an infectious disease sort of ruined our lives collectively across the entire globe. We're used to dying of things like heart disease and cancer and, and now, you know, neurological diseases of aging and stuff. Whereas throughout the history of, of humans, we died mostly of infection. And when we discovered antibiotics in the 20th century, that changed everything, right? It changed, obviously, dying of bacterial diseases like pneumonia and, you know, other infections that were very common back then. But it also enabled healthcare workers and physicians to do crazy things like do open heart surgery or give you a, a drug that would suppress your immune system so you could have a new heart or a new set of lungs or you could undergo cancer chemotherapy and extend your life. So antibiotics really have changed all of the ways that you know, we envision healthcare and also the way that we sort of leave the world most of the time. But all of those advances, which happened honestly in a really short period of time, you know, through a few decades in the 20th century, we failed to keep up with it. We failed to deliver new, new drugs because of the resistance issue. They're in constant demand. So that's part of the reason why those of us in the field are quite concerned is because we have this sort of constant pressure of resistance because of evolution. In, in the bacteria, again, not in us. But we also don't have a new supply of drugs because we're relying on the ones that we discovered 50, 60 years ago. And they're increasingly less effective, again, because of resistance. This is where at least we start to get to the good news part of this story. Can you tell me about... Uh... Zolif Lodison, did I say that right? That's the first question. And second of all, <laughs> what is it? What does it do? So you did say it, right? Zolif Lodison is, is really a great good news story in that it's among the first new, like, you know, without getting two technochemical classes of antibiotics that we've seen in probably since the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So, you know, remember heavy metal and big hair, uh, that was the last time we got a new drug. Right. So um, this antibiotic, Z Zolifloresin, it has a very different chemical structure. It hits very interesting target within the bacteria. And it really is a, a reminder that we can continue to innovate in this area and deliver new drugs if we have, you know, the will and, and honestly, at the end of the day, the financial means to do so. Why don't we have those things? Or why, I'll get back to Zoloflotus in, in a second, but you've touched on it a couple of times now. Um, antibiotics have changed life on this planet for humans. Why did we let ourselves fall so far behind in this race? Yeah, so that's, that's just an outstanding question, Jordan. There's a lot of reasons why we have failed to keep up with the with the bacteria and this this constant evolution of resistance some of them are scientific our major source over the last 100 years or so of new antibiotics has been going out actually to the environment looking for bacteria that live in the soil and fungi and and molds that uh, are circulating around who have been battling with each other for hundreds of millions and billions of years, and they produce most of the antibiotics that we have come to enjoy. And many of us have heard the story of, of Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin because, you know, a drop of mold landed on his Petri dish and right. he recognized that that environmental contaminant was killing the bacteria on his, on his Petri dish. So drug companies learned from that accident and started to mine these microorganisms that live in the environment and found all these wonderful new drugs, all the mycins that keep us alive. But they stopped being successful in finding new drugs this way roughly in the 1970s. So they kept finding the same old ones again. It's easy to find penicillin again. Uh, it's hard to find the next new 
new drug. And so as that was happening, the drug companies sort of moved away from, from that source and started looking to other kinds of drug-like compounds produced by chemists. But those turned out to be pretty much useless against bacteria because bacteria, you know, they're highly evolved and, and like to have, they're sneaky as, as heck and they can avoid mm -hmm. just about any kind of chemistry that, that a chemist can think of. So that started to happen. And then the other thing that happened was the financial model changed. And that is, you know, drug companies make a lot of money by selling, you know, me, my cholesterol lowering medicine, because I have to take it every day. If I stop taking it, you know, it goes away. But antibiotics cure diseases, right? And so curing a disease means that you take your antibiotic for whatever, seven to 10 days. And with any luck, you'll never have to take it again. So the business model looks very different, right? You can either, takes just as much work to find a drug to, that lowers your cholesterol as it does to find a new antibiotic. So you're going to give, you're going to bet on something that you have to take every day or something that's actually going to cure the disease and then your market goes away. It's kind of a crass way to put it, but it's kind of, it's, at the end of it, that's what it boils down to. So what happens is that the, the companies who invest so significantly to, to deliver drugs just look at the return on investment and say, well, it doesn't make sense to be in this field anymore because we just can't make our money back. And so you've got the scientific problem of where do I find the next new leads for drugs? And then you've got the financial problem. And that's a perfect storm that, you know, started to hit us in the early 2000s and to the point where now it's becoming, you know, drug companies that work on antibiotics are as rare as hen's teeth. So where did uh, Zola Flotison come from then, and, and how was it put together, given both factors you just mentioned? So Zola Flotison is a good news story for the chemists. It's a, it's a very, it's a completely synthetic molecule hmm. that came from chemists working originally at AstraZeneca several years ago. AstraZeneca, what, as many of you or many of the listeners I'm sure will know, is, is a well-known international drug company. And they also looked at the you know, writing on the wall and said, we're out of antibiotics. So they was discovered there and they spun out the antibiotics division into its own entity that was called Entasis. And they took that, that compound with them or that drug lead with them. And they continued to work on it to, con you know, to do all the work that's necessary to show that it wasn't toxic, that it showed it was effective in adult models of infection and what have you. And then it took a not-for-profit entity called Guard P, which is an interesting new advance uh, in our field, this kind of organization that's, whose goal is not to, to make a profit, but is simply to try and bring new antibiotics. Guard P stands for Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership. Who is it made up of? So it's a, it's a really fascinating group. It was formed by the WHO, the World Health Organization, and a group called DNDI. So these are the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. And DNDI is funded by a number of public health-oriented, philanthropic organizations like the Wellcome Trust, uh, like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and among many others, and including uh, some countries directly so that amalgamation of contributors and sponsors together recognized that, that new antibiotics amounted to in neglected diseases like leishmania, for example, or, you know, or sleeping sickness, or these diseases that we don't typically think drug companies will invest in because the markets are so small and so far away. So they got together and built this thing, Guard P, and Guard P is what spent this significant amount of money and organizational networking that was necessary to run, you know, what was called a phase three clinical trial that is a large-scale efficacy and safety trial in a number of countries for this new antibiotic. So the history of, of this molecule is quite interesting and convoluted and has a lot of heroes and losers around along the way as it moved from a large pharmaceutical firm to a small spin-out firm to having to rely on a not-for-profit to actually make it obvious that you can actually use it as a brand new drug. 
What is this drug used for currently? And what is the big picture for it? What does it tell us about what's coming and where we're going? Yes, so azulifloticin is targeted uh, right now for the treatment of gonorrhea. So gonorrhea is a very interesting bacterial infection. It's caused by an, an organism called Neisseria gonorrhea, which is actually a very hard to grow bacteria in the lab. And for the longest time, it was highly susceptible to penicillin. It was one of the big success stories of the discovery of penicillin in the Second World War. Right. And if, you know, the joke goes that if you just showed gonorrhea isolate, you know, the label from penicillin, it would die. It was, it was so sensitive. And then in the 1970s, as it was started to get used quite a significant amount, it became resistant to those frontline drugs. And then, then over the last 40 or 50 years, it's become resistant to all the second line drugs that the infectious disease uh, clinicians use to treat this infection. And, you know, it's, it's a sexually transmitted disease and a lot of it's got some stigma with it, obviously, but it's quite serious. You know, it can cause uh, infertility. It can cause ectopic preg- pregnancies. Right. It's not just, you know, a, a giggle in the, in the locker room kind of thing anymore. And so what had happened is we created, you know, for colloquially these strains or we selected for by evolution and exposure to antibiotics these strains that we call super gonorrhea that are resistant to all first and second line drugs out there, which meant you can't cure the disease anymore. Hmm. So drug-resistant gonorrhea made all the sort of most wanted lists for all the big agencies out there, the WHO, Centers for Disease Control, uh, Health Canada, as something that we were really quite concerned about, that the fact that we had no drugs available to treat this infection, you know? And again, just to re- remind you, like you would, even a, cu- a decade ago, we wouldn't be even worried about this. So along comes this drug and, and it shows to be highly effective against these super resistant uh, Neisseria gonorrhea strains. And about a hundred million people a year across the globe get infected with gonorrhea. And you can imagine the pain and suffering that that it causes if you can't treat it. So, So this is a big, Good news story because, you know, we have the first new drug to be able to treat what is becoming an untreatable infection that is quite common across the globe. I had no idea that gonorrhea had become that resistant to drugs and become that serious. I I heard you mention, you know, it's not just a, I knew it wasn't a giggle in the locker room kind of thing, but had no idea that it was kind of the face of these antibiotic resistant strains. Yeah. And it's one of the drug-resistant strains that we worry about a lot because it's community-acquired, right? Right. So a lot of the drug-resistance problems, the multi-drug-resistant bacteria that we face that, that you know, infectious disease clinicians are, are most worried about tend to be contained to hospitals and long-term care facilities where we use a lot of antibiotics in the first place. This is a community-dispersed superbug. And, you know, it's nerve wracking to, to have this, you know, uh, uh, spreading across the globe as it has. And because of the stigma associated with it, oftentimes people don't want to go for treatment or they're embarrassed to go. So even when they finally do uh, manage to get to a, a clinic somewhere and to find out that there's nothing to be able to treat it, you know, it's, it's a terrible situation for us to be in in the 21st century. So this new drug is is really outstanding news for us. So it's already a huge win uh, for its efficacy against gonorrhea. Last question is just like, in the big picture, how much is it worth to the medical community, to humanity, to know that, you know, with this kind of model and this kind of effort, we can stay ahead of these bacteria? I'm hoping, because I tend to be a hopeful person, I'm hoping that what this is, is, is maybe the, the turning of the page to show that, you know, you can initiate programs in, you know, a for-profit situation. You can have them evaluated using funds provided by organizations that are in it for the sake of getting drugs to patients who need them as opposed to patients who are paying for them. 
And it becomes really important in this field. And I think this model, I'm hoping it's not a one-off. I'm hoping that the folks who fund Guard P uh, see this as a big success and as a way to go forward. I know that governments across the globe are are waking up to the danger of multidrug resistant bacteria, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and the impact it can have on society and our healthcare system. You know, it's it's most countries around the globe right now have a an action plan to deal with antibiotic resistance. The unfortunate thing is most of them, including Canada, are not funding it. But, you know, there's a plan on the paper. So that's a step one. And, and maybe with examples such as this one, we could actually see that there, it's not an unsolvable problem that we can move forward. There, there are labs, you know, in universities and in small companies and even in some pharma still full of people who care deeply about this problem, who don't want to see us change the way we die. Where they want go back to what it was like before antibiotics were discovered and, and brought into clinical use. So there's a lot of willingness to go forward. There's a lot of great scientific advances at this point to be able to help push that those scientific problems aside and start to solve them. It just requires, you know, recognition at all levels of society that this is something, this is a problem we want to solve because we don't want to go back to a situation where we're dying of infections instead of, you know, dying of old age. And now at the very least, we have a prime example we can hang our hat on to say this is how we do it. This is how it can be done. Jerry, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, for being so hopeful, for being so informative. It's always nice to cover a good news story. So thanks again. It's entirely my pleasure, Jordan. So thanks for your interest. Dr. Jerry Wright of McMaster University. That was the big story I told you. Good news all week. Nothing wrong with that for a change. You can find the rest of Good News Week uh, right here in whatever feed you're listening to The Big Story on, or you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. If you've got some good news to share with us or some bad news, which we'll get back to in the new year, I promise, you can let us know by finding us on Twitter at the Big Story FPN or sending us an email to hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us and leaving us a voicemail. That number, in case you haven't memorized it the way I have, is 416-935-5935. The Big Story is available in every single podcast player, and of course, on your smart speaker. If you get one for Christmas, ask it to play The Big Story podcast. Make that the first thing it ever does. Christen it properly. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.